السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت إن شئت تجعل الحزن سهلا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من أن نشرك بك شيئا نعلمه ونستغفرك لما لا نعلمه ثم أما بعد um, I think we can see the spirit of Ramadan MashaAllah the masjid is full of fuel already and um, it's a great sign okay so brother Mazhar will take care of this and you have Mazhar and Mansur because so <coughs> Um, I would like to start by talking about, uh, just to wrap up what I said in the Friday khutbah and then inshallah we'll talk about the virtues of the month of Ramadan and then um, we'll open the floor for um, questions inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said clearly in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Because of the significance and the importance of fasting and the great benefits of it and the great reward for those who fast, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it obligatory upon all the believing men and women before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And there were different kinds of fasting, different forms of fasting, abstaining from something, staying away from something. We know in Surah Maryam, Right? When she came with carrying Jesus, um, they told her who this and she told them that I'm fasting. Fasting from what? From speaking. So at that time in this ummah, according to their sharia, they used to fast the whole um, uh, day. Um, and this is their fast. Inni nadartu rahmani sawman falan ukallim al According to Islamic teaching, it is prohibited for someone to intentionally say nothing the whole day. That's, that kind of fasting is not allowed now. Um, but they used to fast from something that's desirable. But in, fasting in general is about giving up some desires, right? For, to achieve another desire. And this is something we need to focus on because unfortunately Ramadan is in, in, in some people's mind, Muslims and non-Muslims, Ramadan is about deprivation, right? Not eating or drinking. So, the, which in many people's minds is so sort of negative thing. Oh, Muslims don't eat or drink the whole day? That's tough. That's difficult. But the point we have to make or need to make is that we give up some of our desires to achieve something is more desirable. Can you remember or think of any? of these more desirable things that we want to achieve by giving up by giving up some of our desires. Huh? Al Akhirah in Al Akhirah you, you are talking about we desire the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please him and to achieve paradise. That's that's one thing. But even in this dunya we don't have to wait until the hereafter to see the fruit of fasting. This is the beauty of it. That's why we need to think Collectively, we need to think together about these benefits, right? Because sometimes we fast the month of Ramadan because it's a good social tradition. Yeah, we fast, it's good, but we don't think deep about the meaning of it. So in this dunya, we can see the fruit and the result of fasting in this dunya. It's, I always give this example, going to the gym, right? You pay money, you drive, you spend some time, you work out, sometimes you have to, you know, burn your muscles, work very hard. It's, it's painful, right? For those of you who exercise, I wish most of you do. But why we put ourselves in this pain? Why do you have to spend money and spend time and go to the gym and, you know, carry this heavy weight and do this exercise until we cannot do anymore, right? We reach the point where we cannot add any more um, uh, um, training. We have to stop there because khalas, yeah, you reach your limit. And we do this intentionally. So we are giving up 
staying home, our convenience of staying home. Um, but we put ourselves in this painful exercise because we want to achieve something greater, which is uh, to be in shape, right? Our other American term, terminology, I don't want to say. But we want to be in a good health and to be strong and to look good and to lose weight and all these useful things, right? So in this, with this analogy, we do fast Ramadan, giving up something to achieve something greater. We need to focus on the positive. Can we turn the fan a little bit? If you don't mind. Um, in this dunya, we also want to achieve more desirable um, desire uh, or more preferable desires. Like what? Like feeling the closeness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, enjoying reading Al Quran, um, getting more guidance, achieve taqwa, try to be better humans. As we mentioned two khutbas before, Yaqan Abudwa, Yaqan Astain, Ibadah does not benefit Allah, it benefits us. It, it, it lifts up, us up. It lifts up our spirit, our spirituality, and our akhlaq, and our intellect, our understanding of the real values in this dunya. So these are more desirable. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to think that, yes, there are certain things you desire and you need, in fact. But this is not the only desire that you need to satisfy. There are other desires you need to feel. And this is what we feel in Ramadan. That we feel when we, when we pray, when we come for taraweeh, and when we make dua, we feel the closeness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is actually more desirable. Uh, that's why when we think about the saints and uh, Sahaba and Tabi'in, those who do things that we just, you know, uh, uh, talk about and we cannot even imagine. Um, it's not, it, it's not like, a, it's a painful uh, process. It is, it is, you know, they don't enjoy anything at all. They do enjoy it. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu said that if our hearts um, uh, were our, our hearts being uh, uh, purified, we would not have given up or we wouldn't have given up the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We wouldn't have felt tired or bored of the Quran because the heart is clean and pure. The Quran brings more enjoyment. So, so yes, we give up something to achieve something else. You know, and when we achieve it, believe me, and we will we'll taste the sweetness of al-ibadah, closeness from Allah, dua. This is another desirable thing. So we need, just Ramadan comes to, to, to help us create this balance between the things that we desire that we have to fulfill and paying attention to a, another kind of desires that we need to, um, uh, to enjoy as well. So it's كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ When we um, read the story of Adam and Eve, the story goes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Adam and his wife to enjoy everything in paradise, to eat from all trees except one tree. It was something prohibited. Right? And of course this Jannah is not the Jannah al-Khuld that Allah talks about in the hereafter that, that the believers will be in. So this is a different place, different nice place, Jannah. Uh, but that's not Jannah al-Khuld, Jannah al-Firdaus and Jannah al um, Because Jannah al-Khuld there is no taklif, there is no um, responsibilities um, for, for, for anybody. Uh, there is no more trials. You know. so, but Allah subhanahu wa told Adam you cannot eat from this particular tree. Right? So we know the story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned him from eating from this and he told him shaitan is your greatest enemy. And the question would be why? Why, why this tree? You know? Why this prohibited tree? It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to perfect you know, the humanity of Adam. And Adam and his progeny, they will have desires, they will have reasoning, they will have goals and objectives, but sometimes these desires overwhelm or uh, overtake uh, or overrule the, 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 the rational thinking. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to, to train him, to resist his desire. And this is exactly what this, our situation. We have everything is halal except few things that made haram. Right? We can eat all things except we can name the prohibited things, but we cannot name the halal things. We can drink all kind of um, you know, juice or uh, beverage except certain things that intoxicate. And this is again good for us. But yet some people, um, they, they, um, their, their desires or the desire to consume these things um, uh, overrules their rational thinking. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants Adam to resist. And we have to resist because there are so many options, so many choices we have every day. And based on what to make choices? Is it always based on rational thinking? Or based on emotion? Or driven by desire? Or peer pressure? Or social pressure? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be um, independent and to follow principles, make decisions based on principles. So, so that's why Allah mentioned the fact that He does not intend any difficulty on us. He wants us to enjoy our life, but in the same time to be able to resist and not to be emotional, not, not to follow our desires. To be able to say, no, that's wrong, this is my limit, I have to stop here. Not everyone can do this. Not everyone can do this. So Siyam comes, it could be painful for some, but if we think about the greater um, desires that we want to achieve in Ramadan, we'll thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much, who created us and He knows what's good for us and what can be very harmful for us. So we need to create this balance between you know, fulfilling uh, the desires of the body and also achieve other um, desires. كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. And Allah subhanahu wa taala when He talked about at taqwa, He mentioned the reward of the muttaqin. Allah wants to give us the reward of the muttaqin because Allah is so generous. If all of us are muttaqin, He has place. There's place in Jannah for all humanity. All people. If all people are muttaqin, there will still everybody who has place in Jannah. Jannah is so huge, so big, can accommodate all people if all of them are believers. Um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and Compete, race one another uh, to achieve this Jannah. Its width is as big as as samawat wal ard. Arduha as samawat wal ard. Of course, in the time of the Prophet when people hear as samawati wal ard, what do they think about? The distance between this earth and this heaven. But now we have a another understanding of as samawat. The word samawat, we are talking about millions and billions of light years. Now we can imagine how huge and big this al-jannah. Samawatu, samawat. It's not the sama, samawat, plural. The width of al-jannah is the distance between as samawati wal ard the, the entire you know cosmos as they say so big and so huge and allah wants to reward people allah wants to honor and to um, uh, show his mercy to all people um, and he wants us to achieve taqwa to get this reward so la'allakum tattaqun so when we achieve this taqwa you will get a higher place in in jannah and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, just a year of maldat, few days. And I, as I mentioned, you know, we know it's few days. There's nothing new, no, no new information here. But in this context, it is, you know, as if you are saying, you know, to your son or daughter, you know what, khalas, you know, the exams are just a few more weeks and then you enjoy the summer. It's a few weeks, a few, few days. A yaman ma'adudat. But the benefit of fasting this MLS is tremendous. That's why I want you to fast this. Right? If you have any excuse, and maybe we'll, we'll talk about this valid excuse. There are, there are plenty, plenty of excuses. And if you really read the fiqh of a siyam from different madhahib, you will, you will see how um, easy it, 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 it meant to be. 
right? It, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very simple, very easy. And even there are some opinions that I intentionally don't mention because, you know, it's against the, what we always hear about, so it might shock some of us. But there are opinions. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, as we were studying, um, uh, that Imam al-Shafi'i said the old man or the woman, they don't have to fast or to make up or to feed or to do anything. Why is that? Imam al-Shafi'i said, they are like young kids. Young kids are not, they don't have to fast, right? We, yeah, we can train them to fast, but fasting for them is not obligatory. Similarly, though, uh, a person who is, is, uh, uh, is, is insane, for example, have mental illness, does not understand what's going on, is out of taklif, is not responsible. No fasting, no salah, no taklif, no, nothing, right? And similarly, if someone grew old, um, even if he's wealthy, he can feed. But he does not have to. He does not have to. Why? Because he's out of taklif. There's no taklif. There's no responsibilities. Allah is talking to those who can fast. And those who can make up the days they, they had to, um, uh, not to fast. But for these people, they, they are out of taklif altogether. So you don't have to feed. You don't have to do anything. Even if they are wealthy, yeah, even if they are wealthy. If they want to feed, that's fine. And so on. There are plenty of, of opinions regarding um, uh, al siyam But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at the ayat of siyam you'll find these two themes. Very, very clear. One is Allah's mercy and compassion and love. Right? Yeah, you that few days. Um, if you have any excuse, you don't have to. And interestingly, in the last ayah, the long ayah, the beginning of fasting was different from the fasting we do now. In the beginning, a person might eat or drink after Maghrib, but if he went to sleep, from this moment he cannot eat or drink for the whole night. It happened actually. Someone was working very hard the whole day fasting, he came home, he was very tired before Maghrib, and he asked his wife, his wife was cooking something, right? And he went to get some rest, and he slept. And she, when she was done cooking, this was after Maghrib, she came and she found him sleeping. Oh my God, then he cannot eat. Khalas, that's it. You have to wait for the next day. And he went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Fajr Salah said, Rasulullah was very tired yesterday. I was extremely hungry. And I came home and I was waiting for the food to be ready. I slept and then I had to wait for another time. Okay? And of course, they cannot eat or drink and to have any um, intimate relationship with their wives. And then the ayat came. And the last ayat in Surah Al Baqarah that talk about Siyam. The only time that we're allowed to break their fast is between Maghrib and almost Isha. And after Isha, خلاص, that's it. Allah said, from now on, you can, you can enjoy your relationship with your spouses. Allah knows that you used to um, trick yourself. It happened to one of the companions. You know, <laughs> after he ate the breakfast, um, he took a nap, but he convinced himself, no, 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 I did not sleep. And his wife told him, no, 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 taqillah, stay away from me because you did sleep. So, no, no, I don't sleep. <laughs> it happened. It was very difficult, it's much more difficult than it is now. Right? And he argued with his wife. His wife said, no, you did sleep. He said, no, I did not. And so the Quran was clear. Alim Allahu annakum kuntum taqtanun anfusakum. You're you're lying to yourself. You know you tried to convince yourself that. You're, but but Allah knows that. Alim annakum kuntum taqta fatab alaykum wa afa ankum. That is forgiven. خلاص. From now on, you can ukulu wa shrabu hatta yatabayyin alakum al khayt al abiyat min al khayt al aswad min al fajr. You have up until fajr. So the question is why? Why it started like this and then changed? Because you know many uh, uh, 
Orientalists, they, they think it, Muhammad is the one who made this. There's no connection with God. It's just made up religion. And Muhammad changed the law because he tried something. It didn't work. It, this is how they think about it. Of course, we, we don't think of it this way. But if, if it was from Allah, then why? Didn't Allah know that it's going to be difficult? And the law will change soon after? So what's the point of changing this legislation? The point is obvious that it could have been much harder than this. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to tell us that you have the entire night to eat and drink and nisa'ukum harthun lakum fa'tu harthakum an nashi. Right? It's out of his mercy. He made it easier for you. Right? Can you imagine if this was the case still today? You have between Maghrib and Isha, and that's it. It would have been very difficult, right? But we had to do what Allah wants to do. Could have been this way or that way. So we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for changing this. And then he said, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ يعني You can eat and drink until you see Al-Fajr. ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ الصِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ Layl here means Al-Maghrib. And the second theme, this one theme, is covered with mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so merciful. Starting with this lovely call, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Few days. If you have excuse, no problem. I don't want to intend to, you know, cast any difficulties in you. And so on. And the other theme is rational thinking. Reflecting why fasting is important and, and so significant. Maqasid, objectives of sharia. There are ulama and maqasid. They divided maqasid into three kinds of maqasid. General, um, particular, and uh, the general maqasid, maqasid kulliya, maqasid juz'iya, or uh, partial, and specific maqasid. General, partial, and specific. The general maqasid, the maqasid of sharia, all together. What are the maqasid of sharia? They said there are five main maqasid. The, to reserve people's life, religion, mind, uh, property, and their dignity, or some uh, interpret dignity as progeny, the progeny of, of people. These are the five maqasid started by Imam al-Shatibi, um, and, and now other scholars added some to this. And these maqasid juz'iyya, juz'iyya when we talk about um, al-siyam, for example, what is the general maqasid of siyam? It's taqwa, right? So what is the maqasid of suhoor? That's very specific. What is the maqasid, what is the objective of suhoor? Right? Is we, we can talk about the maqasid. So there is general, uh, uh, particular, and specific maqasid when you go down in more details. Right? So by thinking about the maqasid in the individual level, in the family level, social level, and the community level. Uh, in Ramadan, most of Muslims they give more sadaqah in Ramadan. They pay zakat al mal and zakat al fitr. And even they donate here and there. We are more generous in Ramadan. Why, why is that? Generosity has nothing to do with the amount of money we have. It's not only the wealthiest people who give zakah. That, that's not true. That's not true. It has everything to do with the level of taqwa. When we have more taqwa, we give more. That's why, who, who is the most generous one? You know, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Because he have taqwa more than anybody else right in ramadan he is more generous than the wind that drives the clouds you know the, the this is this is the, the the analogy that they give this person is more generous than al the wind that pushes the cloud to bring water this for them this was life right so nothing could be more generous than this but he is they said he's even more generous than this wind. At the time when Jibreel comes to him to study Al-Quran. So in Ramadan, we feel that our taqwa level goes up and it's a challenge to, to, to maintain this level of taqwa. It might not be the same as in Ramadan, it might go down a little bit, but at least um, we can keep a part of it. So it is rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and number two, maqasid. Objectives. Think about the objectives. And we need to think together about these objectives. And this would lead us to think about 
how to plan for Ramadan. From now, before the first night of Ramadan, we need to get a pen and paper and to rush us right down. What do I want to get out of this Ramadan? Because if, 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 if you um, fail to plan, you have a plan to fail, right? So let's plan. You know yourself and your shortcomings, what you want to improve on and what are your um, uh, problems. You get angry very quickly, you, you don't spend that much in sadaqah. Maybe you have so many problems with your kinship and your family members. Maybe this is the time I will, inshallah, work on these things. I don't come frequently to the masjid, except for Juma. I'll try to come more to the masjid. I don't contribute anything in the masjid. I don't, I'm not talking about money only, but I am not helping in any way. And we always need volunteers. We always need people to, you know, to do or to participate in one of the so many committees we have. And maybe community service, think about it. I want to find what is the community, what, which community that I feel that I can work with, Dawa committee, CAC committee, or educational committee, or um, um, what other committees do we have? Um, huh? Conest, no, this is, this is <laughs> I don't recommend anybody to join this committee now. <laughs> All right, but there are plenty of activities going on. Think about it. I, I want to um, take part of this. I can help. I can volunteer in this. I want to give my community something back. So we need to, to, to plan for Ramadan. And I would suggest five things that all of us must think about and take very seriously. These five things are number one, Al Quran. Al Quran, number two, Al Dua, number three, Qiyam al Layl, or Qiyam or Taraweeh or Tahajjud. And number four, um, our family members. And number five is Sadaqa. Sadaqa, different forms of Sadaqa. Ramadan is the month of Al Quran. Shahr Ramadan al Ladi, Unzila fihi Al Quran. Number of imams, they used to take time out of lecturing and teaching fiqh and hadith and uh, Islamic history or philosophy. They, 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 they quit all these things. Number of imams. They used to have plenty of halakas of tafsir and language, Arabic language and fiqh and hadith. This is no, Ramadan is just for Quran. That's why Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu used to do khatm Quran every night, every night in Ramadan. He reads Quran all day and whatever left, he spends the night praying and finishing Khatm Quran every night. Right. Some used to do Khatm Quran every three nights. They do 10 juz every day. So every three days, they finish the Quran, start another Khatm Quran. Right. Some are more lazy. They do it once a week, every week, seven days. One Khatm Quran, so we have four. And other are more lazy, they do it once every 10 days. Every 10 days, do one Khatm Quran. So they have three Khatm Quran in Ramadan. Imam al Shafi'i, a number of sources, and I don't know how, I, I don't know how. They said that he used to do 60, 60, twice a day. Every 24 hours, this Khatm Quran, two Khatm Quran. So 60 times in Ramadan, so I obviously have no time for fiqh or teaching anybody, you know, it's, it's, Ramadan is the month of Al-Quran. They have their own Mus'haf, they read from the Mus'haf. They are hafiz, of course, but they read because looking at the Mus'haf is ibadah itself. Looking at the Quran and, and reading, if, even if you are hafiz, it's always good to open the Mus'haf and read Al-Quran, right? And some used to do Khatm al-Quran and another Khatm al-Quran in Ramadan. Some masajid do this. Yeah, this Khatm al-Quran Taraweeh and another Khatm al-Quran in uh, last 10 nights. So they start Alif Lam Mim, the first night of Adikaf, and the night of Eid, they're, they're, they're done. While praying, it's not just reading um, all day long. So Shahr Ramadan is the month of al-Quran. 
and we need to um, uh, link ourselves with the Quran. Is it only reading? Um, is it better to read so long uh, uh, surahs or many pages, even if you don't understand, or it's better to read less and to dedicate some time to read the tafsir? Two schools of thought. Some said, no, reading more is better because every, with every letter of the Quran, you get 10 hasanat, every letter. And others said, no, other school, like Abdullah ibn Abbas used to say that to read sur short surah with, with tafakkur is better than reading a big or long surah uh, without any tafakkur. So um, it's always good to have an understanding. So if you read half page a day and read the tafsir of it, and be consistent with it. Just, the, the, this is the key point. Just try to be consistent. And believe me, at the end of the month, you, you will achieve, you know, great thing. So how many pages? 15 pages? You read, if you read half page and you know their tafsir, that, that's tremendous, excellent. And hopefully this can lead to more understanding of the Quran. Number two, Qiyamul Layl. Qiyamul Layl, Rasulullah sallallahu said in the hadith, Man qama Ramadan, imanan wa ahtisaban ghufra lahu ma taqaddama min dambi. Whoever prays the Qiyam, in, in every night of Ramadan, Allah will forgive all his sins. So, should we, can we pray at home if we cannot make it the masjid? If you can make it the masjid, that is much better, right? But what if you cannot? You are t so tired. You have been working all day and you barely uh, were able to fast. You don't have to pray in jama'ah. You can pray at home. But I'm not half as. You can pray two, four, six, or eight rakah, that would be great. It doesn't have to be very long, but don't say either. You miss it in the masjid, then khalas, there's no way to get. You can make it at home. Pray any number of rakahs to be included among those who did qiyam in Ramadan, right? It's ideal to count pray in the masjid. If you cannot wait until the end of the 20 rakah, just pray eight and then pray which? And go, that's more than enough. This is also sunnah of the Prophet, according to the hadith of Aisha, Bukhari. She said that Rasulullah did not pray more than 11 rakah in Ramadan or out of Ramadan. Eight rakahs plus three, that's it. That's good enough. It doesn't have to be 20. Right? If you can wait, do it. Um, if you cannot even come to the masjid, you are so tired, and pray Aisha and pray any number of rakahs. But don't miss any, don't let any night pass by without praying qiyam. Right? Dua. Rasulullah said, Inna lissa'imi da'watun la turad. For the fasting person, a dua that will not be rejected. And the other narration, Inna lissa'imi, in the fitri, at the time of his iftar, the dua that will not be rejected. So, never let a day pass by without making sincere dua. Before Maghrib, at the time when, before you eat, date, or drink anything, just make dua at that time. Inshallah, this dua will um, be accepted. A dua also in the last third of the night, the night, the, the, the last two hours um, before, before, of the night, before Fajr. Um, this is the time of Al-Sahar, uh, and, and the, the, the meal called Suhoor because it's done in the time of Sahar. Um, this also the good time for dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls upon us, if there anyone wants, uh, we're asking for forgiveness so that I, I may forgive him. Anyone ask for anything that I may give to him. So Allah calls us and, and, and whatever you want, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And number um, four, there are sometimes tensions within the family and that's not good. No, that's not good because this is the rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created a rahim, he said, I give you a name and a rahman. And this is a rahim. I, I gave you a name that's driven from my name. Whoever connects you, I'll connect with him. Whoever disconnect with you, I'll disconnect him. So um, we, we, we have to work on these things. It might not be easy, but this is the time to do this. To call our um, brothers and sisters and cousins and send them gifts. And, and those who deserve zakah, we should give them our zakah, of course, without telling them, this is, by the way, my zakah. Right? But you can send it as a gift um, for their children, whatever. 
but we need to uh, work on this. Allah said that, give your kinship their rights. Masakin, they have their haqq. Your relatives have haqq on you. Okay, so we have to give them their rights. And finally, sadaqa. Sadaqa, uh, I'm not talking about zakat al-mal or zakat al-fitr. I'm talking about even giving more. Um, if you notice in the hole there, there, is, there are uh, boxes. And this is for a project done by MMCC. Um, that's called fighting, uh, fighting the hunger. In Ramadan, fight against hunger. Fight against hunger. And very simple idea. We collect food and we put it in the center place. We uh, uh, distribute this food to those who are in need. Our growing number of people who don't have the uh, pleasures and, and the, the, the blessings we have. So we just need to think about it. We need also think about Muslim brothers and sisters who are suffering tremendously in Burma, in, in Kashmir, in Somalia, and in, in Syria, and all these places. We really need to think about them. We need to think how can we help them. We see the news and we see the horrible pictures, um, but uh, what do we do? We do nothing. We do nothing. So we just watch the news. But we have to take one step forward. That We need to do something. And there are plenty of, of uh, organizations who collect money and send it to these um, uh, communities. So we need to think about, about this sadaqah. Let me very quickly um, read some of the hadith that talks about um, the blessings of the month of Ramadan. And then, inshallah, we'll um, um, open for a question and answer. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said hadith on Abi Hurayat radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in the first night of Ramadan, this is what, what happens. The, all the gates of Jannah will open up and all the gates of the hellfire are closed and the leaders of jinn will be chained and a caller would call up, O oh, seeker of good, come forward, and O oh, seeker of evil, stay away. And there are, or there is, number of people every night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect them from the hellfire every single night beautiful hadith wonderful so does this suggest that the gates of the hell are open all year long and the gates of Jannah are closed and when Ramadan comes the opposite happens should we understand it in the literal sense that the, the doors will literally open up and the gates of Jahannam will close down? Or it's a metaphorical expression? And all of some said, no, it's, it's real. And others said, no, it means that the doors for doing good deeds are open up. And these good deeds are, the, are in fact, the, the gates of Jannah. This is our way to Jannah, right? So... It's the asbab, yani, the sabab, the means. The means of going to Jannah is doing good deeds. So when Ramadan comes, these doors of sadaqah, Quran, qiyam, siyam are open. And therefore, the, open, the, the, the gate of Jannah will open up. And the gates of Jahannam are the sins that we commit. Forgetfulness. Neglect our duties, and so in Ramadan we close these doors, and therefore the doors of Jan of Jahannam will also be closed, and the devils will be chained, right? Um, but the question comes: So why do people sin, or rather steal some even Ramadan? It's because there are shayateen, but not jinn. This is not every shaitan is jinn. Are humans? who play the role of shaitan. In fact, someone was joking and saying that now shaitan is just watching, doing nothing because people are doing his job and they even supersede his tricks and, 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 and suggestions. I mean, he, shaitan is surprised that the humans, they, wow, I, I, I didn't even think about this. So there are shaitan of humans who are, are really doing a wonderful job and shaitan is just retired now is happy you know these people are doing my job they're excellent um 
and we have to, to watch ourselves that because because um, think some evil comes from within ourselves and every single night maybe your name is there maybe maybe next night maybe last night Allah but there is a chance for your name to be written in this list of the people that will be guaranteed that the hellfire will never come close to them right and this hadith suggests every single night some people will be chosen you and you and you خلاص. you are we don't know but in the in the hereafter you will you will find out that on that night of this ramadan and this year your name was written could it be written last year or the year before or any year before could be but since we don't know we have to keep trying right every night it could be the first night last night any night in between doesn't have to be that qabr In the other hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, As-salawatu al-khams wal-jumu'atu ila al-jumu'a wa ramadanu ila ramadan mukaffiratu lima baynahunna idha jtunibat al-kaba'ir. The sins that you commit between one salah and the other is forgiven. So, you pray dhuhr, then you sin, Salat al-Asr will clean it. You pray Asr, then you sin, then Salat al-Maghrib will clean it, and so on. And the time between last Friday and this Friday, if you pray Jum'a, then the whole week will be forgiven. And any sin you commit next week, when you pray Jum'a next week, all these sins will be forgiven. Um, in the other hadith, وَالْعُمْرَةُ wa, إِلَى umrah From one Umrah to the other, all sins committed between these two Umrahs will also be forgiven. وَرَمَضَانُ إِلَى رَمَضَانُ مُكَفِّرَاتٌ لِمَا بَيْنَهُنَّ if you do not commit one of the major sins, in other words, these Salah, Jum'ah, Ramadan do not take care of these major sins, like killing, shirk, and um, mistreating our parents, and all these things are, you know, this, this requires another, you know, we have to take time out and make tawbah, and, and, and then we move on, then it will, it will be forgiven. The other hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa hadith Ammar ibn Yasir, the very famous hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, went on the three steps of his member uh, and said, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. And then they asked, Ya Rasulullah, uh, what, what, what do you say, Ameen? He said, Jibreel came to me and he made dua. And one of these three things he said is, Khaba wa khasir, man adraka Ramadan wa al-Mufalla. May he lose, the one who reached Ramadan and he came out of Ramadan, and he was not forgiven. If you don't give forgiveness in Ramadan, when would we get it? The other dua, may he lose the one who uh, found one or both of his parents and these did not lead him to enter paradise. So if you found both your parents or one of them, this is your gate to Jannah. In other words, if you don't make them happy, then may you lose, right? Because if they are happy with you, that, that will take, inshallah, you to Jannah. And the Rasulullah said, Ameen. And then Jibreel said, may he lose the one who hears your name and he does not send peace and blessing upon you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So Ramadan is the time for forgiveness. Um, also, um, Al-Umrah in Ramadan in particular, it's equal to Hajj. So if you can make Umrah in Ramadan, you'll get the reward of Hajj. But if you did not make Hajj, you still have to make the Hajj. But when it comes to the reward, then you get the reward of Hajj, inshallah. And of course, uh, Laylatul Qadr, um, uh, Laylatul Khayrun min Alf Shahr, the last 10 days of Ramadan in the odd nights. And as I mentioned before, I will say it again. One of the famous opinions is that it's in the 27th, but this is not, not, the, not with, with certainty. We don't know exactly when it is, right? Um, the Jafari Madhab, they think it's the 19th. Imam Shafi'i believes the 21st. 
And every odd night you find a number of scholars, they think it is this night. So from the 21st until 29th, all these odd nights could be the Laylat Al-Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Siyam, Every act of the son of Adam is for him, except fasting. It's for me. It's made purely to me. There's no shirk, no place for showing off or anything because it's, it's, it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how difficult and tough it is, said the reward for this or is going to be only known to them in the day of judgment al hasana al hasana when you do one good deed you get 10 rewards up to 700 so but for some we don't know allah said that that's for me and i will be the one who rewards them we don't know exactly what kind of reward that allah subhanahu wa is storing for those who fast for his sake in the last night of Ramadan, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there will be plenty of people free from the hellfire. They said, Ya Rasulullah, is it Laylatul Qadr? He said, no, this is not Laylatul Qadr. See, and he gave them the example. When someone gets his job done, doesn't he get paid? He said, yes. When they finish their work, they get paid for this. And this, this is the night, the last night of Ramadan. And they get this great payment. A big number of people will get their name, inshallah, among those who will be protected from the hellfire. So we have this wonderful opportunity. Um, great chance. We need to take the best advantage of this uh, beautiful month. Um, increase our ibadah connect ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fix our relationship with uh, those who live around us. And I hope and pray inshallah that we will all together enjoy the great reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment. Rasulullah said there are two joys for the fasting people. The joy they will receive when they finish their fasting, the Eid day, and the other joy when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see the reward of fasting. It will be extremely happy and joyful. We don't know exactly what Allah SWT is storing for these people. And we hope, inshallah, that will make us joyful in the day of judgment, inshallah. I will stop here. And if you have any um, comment or question, inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. we have in electronic devices okay what, what is the question are you asking about the authenticity or the rules apply to carrying the mushaf and all these things no that's not a mushaf we don't call this a mushaf so this can have millions of books but no this is not mushaf. can you take this to the bathroom if you have the mushaf added yes you can because we don't call this mushaf similarly the ulama talked not about this of course but they talked about the books if you have a book of uh, fiqh, right? And this book of fiqh it has a lot of uh, writing of the imam who wrote this book, but there are also ayat and hadith. Do we treat these books as mushaf? No. So if the words in this book are more than the Quran, then that's not called mushaf. But if the Quran is much more than the little words here and there, then we call this mushaf. So we go with the majority of the, the, the content of this book. So for, for uh, sisters or in, in Ramadan and, and they cannot touch the Quran, they can hold their, their, their tablet or smartphone or uh, computer and, and read from, from this um, easily. No, no problem, inshallah. Right? Right. Yes.
Yes. I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, inshallah, yani, it, the whole idea is, is looking at it. It's like honoring it and respecting it and, and, and you have this connection with it. So I, I, I hope it applies to, 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 to all. Because keep in mind, in the time of the Prophet, there was no Mus'haf. There was no Quran like as one book. It was like, like you have like a skin of a, of a goat and then you spread it up and read Surah Al-Balad. Or maybe half of it, and then close it. And if you want to see it to the fajr, you get another sheet. That, that was, or, or a bone that the shoulder is like white, and they write Quran it, so you have these bones here and there. So it, it's, I think it's all about about respect and, 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 and looking at it, whether it's written in a book or written in on, on, on a screen or something like this. Um, No, you can use mouthwash as long as you don't swallow it. I don't recommend, recommend that you swallow it. As long as you are not sw uh, swallowing intentionally. But if you wash your mouth and by accident something came in, that's, that's forgiven. Right? And, and of course, rinse it and try to even use water after it just to make sure that nothing remains there. Keep in mind that Rasulullah used to use siwak, and, and for those of you who are familiar with the siwak, definitely some uh, uh, parts of this siwak would stay somewhere in your mouth, between your teeth and here and there. And you might swallow it, you know, with your saliva. But that's not food, that's not drink, that's not nothing we intentionally swallow, right? It's like you walk on the street and um, the dust comes nose and your mouth and goes down so it's or if your sisters are cooking and this you know all this spicy stuff comes in and so you might feel it inside here but it's not it's not intentional it doesn't happen anything. and the same thing applies to brush your brushing your teeth and things like that Inshallah. you can ask another question if nobody else i don't see other hands so you can ask yes It is general, of course, but the ulama said he's asking about the ayah that says, We have only five ayat. This is one of them, which is not We have only five ayat. This is one of them, which is not is not directly relating to fasting the month of Ramadan. The ayat before talking about fasting Ramadan, the ayat after talking about fasting in Ramadan, but this ayah is general. The ulama said yes, the meaning is general, but to place this ayah between ayat al-siyam in Ramadan, it, 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 it means something. It means that dua is even more desirable in the month of Ramadan. Right? So, so it, there's no direct connection about the place of the ayah itself. The relationship between this ayah and what's mentioned before and after is it, it, it has a meaning that the dua of the fasting person has more significance. In it. Allah Can I go back to you? Uh huh. Yes. During wudu, what do you mean during wudu? No, in general, you can do it. Washing mouth with water, you mean? Oh, oh, okay. Yes, Rasulullah said, Madmada, washing your, your mouth with water and rinsing your nose, but don't exaggerate. He said, or other words, he said, exaggerate unless you're fasting. And that's very useful for the allergy and all these things. So when you do, you know, wash your mouth and your, your uh, nose, do it well. Unless you are fasting, if you are fasting, don't you know get close because water might come inside. So yes, you should. This is the sunnah of the Prophet If we can use siwak, then then why not? 
Actually, actually, there's another important hadith where someone asked his uh, asked the Prophet Sallam that I kissed my wife while fasting. And Rasulullah did not only give the answer, but he gave the answer and he gave him the um, one of the intellectual tools of ijtihad, the called qiyas or analogy. You know, ulama do qiyas all the time. So he said, see if you did madmada, yani if you wash your mouth and you spit this water out, would this harm your fasting? He said, no. I said, similarly, if you kiss your wife, that's not going to harm your fasting. So, so the ulama said that he gave the answer, no, you can't kiss your wife while fasting. It's number one. But number two, he even told him how to reach a conclusion. And the ulama now do all these qiyas all the time. All the time. Because Rasulullah started this. Rasulullah could have said, no, your fasting is good. Okay? But he told him how to use the human intellectual um, uh, uh, analogy to reach the hukm. So as this madmada does not harm your fasting, if you kiss your wife while fasting, that's okay, no problem. But the, some other ulama said, well, that's for the one who can control himself. But for people who are young and just got married a uh, week before Ramadan, and you know, it's better to stay away because one thing can lead to the other. And you don't want to fast two consecutive months. Because as you know, this kafara for one thing, only one thing, is qada and kafara. The ulama said that kafara only when someone has a, an intercourse with his wife during the daytime while fasting. So he has to make this day up and he has to pay a heavy price. What is this? It happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Rasulullah Sallallahu told him, then free a slave. He said, I, I don't have slaves, I cannot. Okay, can you fast two consecutive months? He said, no, I cannot. Can you feed 60 poor people? This is it's heavy. He said, no, I cannot. So he could not do any of the three. So just you wait until, you know, someone brings food for us, we'll give you. So someone came with 15 saar of, of tamr, a good, a good amount of tamr, yeah. It's enough to feed 60 people. He said, take this for you. It's a gift from the Prophet ﷺ. He said, take this and feed 60 people. He does not have slave, he cannot fast two consecutive months. Do you know what it means? If he fasted like 58, <laughs> it has to start all over. It has to be continuous. Then Rasulullah said, okay, take this food and feed 60 people. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, there is no one in need to this food than me and my family. <laughs> and Rasulullah Sallam laughed. I said, go and feed your family then. <laughs> Hadith in Bukhari. And, and see how, how merciful Rasulullah was. Alayhi salatu wa salam. Well, that's, that's uh, similarly in Hajj, by the way. This is, if someone did this while in Ihram, his Hajj is khalas, not valid anymore. But he has to come next year and to do it again. Again, it's, it's all about just controlling ourselves. So, um, if you think you can control yourself, that's fine. But if you think that one thing can lead to the other, I advise you to stay away because you either have to do one of these that fasting two consecutive months or feed 60 people. You don't want to, to, to do that. And the ulama talked, of course, about what if someone did this twice? Does he have to do one kafara or two kafara? Someone said one kafara will be sufficient. Others said no. There are two violations and two kafara, like four consecutive months it would be, or two consecutive months and another two consecutive months. And I, I think that that makes more sense. Then. And uh, because just people need to know how to control themselves, right? Yes. Can the hostility in Arabia continue in Ramadan? Hostility in Arabia is 24-7. I mean, tell me when hostility in Arabia did not stop. But well, I don't understand your meaning, your, your question exactly. Yemen? I assure you it will continue. 
Or are you asking me as a faqir or as a political analyst? Well, there are plenty of crimes committed in the month of Ramadan. I mean, I mean, dictators are dictators, Akhi. They, they, they don't care. Do you think they... Al-Kaaba. Al-Kaaba was destroyed. Because Abdullah ibn Zubair was hiding, not hiding, he was fighting the Umayyads. The Umayyads came from Damascus and they surrounded Al-Masjid Al-Haram during the time of Hajj. And they were throwing big rocks, caterpillars, throwing rocks and the car was destroyed. And many Hajjis were killed. And they came in and they got Abdullah ibn Zubair and they hanged him on one of the pillars for days and weeks. His body was hanged there. You're talking about ISIS? ISIS is very merciful, very modern. But read our history. Our history is full of, of, of bloody and nasty. This in Mecca, in the Masjid al Haram, in the Shahr al Haram. This is how, how dirty politics can be. In the name of Islam, of course. Everything can be justified. Tell me any crime I can, you know, <laughs> use their mentality to justify it from Islam or from Islamic perspective. I don't know why we are talking about this. But I don't expect this to stop any, any time anywhere. In fact, CNN and Fox News and all these, they actually promote the idea, these groups, they, are, they, 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 they increase their activities in Ramadan because their reward is, is doubled in Ramadan. And if you die as Shaheed in Ramadan, that's great. So this is how they look at it. I don't know if this is true, but I wish Ramadan is... is so how, how many years now Hafiz Assad is killing his own people, throwing bombs on, on very condensed residential areas? So Saddam Hussein killed his own people with chemical weapons. And this guy also is killing his own people with chemical weapons. Young children thrown in the floor of the, of the hospitals. The foam comes out of their mouth killed by so-called Muslims. Do you think this will care about Ramadan? When what? The Battle of Badr? It was in Ramadan, the 10th of Ramadan. But this is battle, this is a different story. But um, um, it was not meant to be a battle to start with, but it turned out to be a battle. So if you are defending yourself, you have the right to defend yourself at any time. But for these people, they, they don't care about Ramadan, they don't care about Kaaba, they don't care about Quran, they don't care about Islam. <clears throat> yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, do we have to read Qiyamul Layl Quran in sequence or we can read every night any surah or any ayah? There is no hadith or tradition or any report that Rasulullah used to read this juz number one, juz number two, number three, number four. It's Qiyam. Rasulullah said Qiyam. He did not say how many rak'ah, he could have said, Sallallahu whoever prayed eight rak'ah every night, or whoever prayed 20 rak'ah behind an imam, right? Or whoever prayed one juz every night. Rasulullah could have easily and simply tell us the number of the rak'ahs and what to read and when to read and so on and so forth. But he left it open. And as I mentioned, it's not about the quantity. Wallahi al azim it's not about the quantity. If you pray to rak'ah with khushu' or with, with sincerity, with dua, with glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and you, you shed some tears in it, that's better than 20 or more rak'ahs, just boom, 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 done. How many of you get confused, what rak'ah is this? You know? <laughs> Everybody, you don't know who counts. <laughs> Let the Imam and those who stand behind him you know, know everything. If the Imam made a mistake, those who are behind him will correct him. 
Alhamdulillah, we reach the winter salah. This one we know, we finish the winter rakah. I mean, so, so, so it is, Rasulullah did not tell us any of these things. He, he could have, but, um, and uh, the other day, one of the sisters mentioned the latest halaqa that, uh, yeah, because the Jibreel used to come to Rasulullah every night. That's true, but there's nothing in the report suggested that he used to read one or two Jews the way we do it now. In fact, the hadith said, Kana yudarisuhu al-Qur'an. Yudarisuhu means mudarasa, yani dars, yani. Studying. Could be involved reading, reciting, interpretation, and, and, and so on. And, and making sure that nothing is missing. It's mudarasa. It's not reciting to him, Qur'an. It's mudarasa. It's more than reciting. So why then we do this every night? That's great. Muslim ummah started something that they said Ramadan is 30 nights and Quran 30 Jews, it would be better to read one Jews every night. Makes sense. Can we read more? Yes, we can read more. Can we read less? Of course we can read less. And, and I've seen many masajid, they cannot tolerate this uh, one Jews per night. That's too much for these particular people. So it would be fitna to read so long. People not tolerate it. People not like it. And for those who are used to do Khatm Quran, do Khatm Quran. Can pray two rakah and go home? Fine. Four, eight? It's up to you. You know your schedule, you know yourself, or you're tired, you can stay eight. No restriction. Of course, if you do more, it's better. But the quality also is important. Right? So, so yeah, we do it because we found it to be good. And that's another important thing that not everything that never been done because this is a general definition of bid'ah. This bid'ah, 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 bid'ah. You know what bid'ah means, right? Bid'ah is in, to, to introduce a new tradition that not from Islam. But they expanded this into introducing a tradition that neither the Prophet nor his Sahaba, the first generation, have done. So if you do anything the Prophet didn't do or didn't say, then it's bid'ah, it's haram. I remember this happened actually in the Dearborn Masjid and I used to lead the Salah the way I do it here. We read every day one or two pages. And someone came to me and said, Imam, why are you doing Quran and Fajr and Isha in, in sequence? I said, what's wrong with that? He said, the Prophet never you know, done this and the Sahaba did not do this. I told him, I know that, but the Prophet never prohibited us from doing this. I understand his definition of bid'ah is whatever not being done at that time. And my understanding of bid'ah, to introduce a tradition that goes against the tradition that established by the Prophet. Like for example, if someone says that you pray only two times, not five times a day. Or someone says that you don't have to fast the month of Ramadan. Or you pray Fajr for Raqqa. That's just, that adding something to religion. That is not accepted. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, make dhikr. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, udhkurullah. Can we do dhikr in jama'ah? Like we are doing now, we say adhkar after fajr every day in Ramadan. Or it have to be individually. Al-Quran did not say anything. If we come together, this is not against the Quran. If we do it individually, it's not against the Quran. It's general. Right? So I told him that, that there's no prohibition about it. I said it, but the Prophet didn't do it. And I told him, okay, and I, of course I know what school of thought is coming from. It's, you can just read it immediately. You know, with the kind of question asked and, and, and discussion, you, you, you can tell this is coming from this school of thought. So I, I, I told him, what do you think about the scholars of Saudi Arabia? Do you think they are, they are doing bid'ah? He said, no. He said, but as far as I know, they do khatm al-Quran in Ramadan. He said, right. And they do long dua, they call dua khatm al-Quran. Did the Prophet do that? No. Did the Sahaba did that? No. Do you call these ulama mubtadi'een? He said, no, but... Um, and then he called this hadith. Jibreel used to come to the Prophet every night to study the Quran. He said, okay, there's no point here. If the Prophet studied Quran with the... Uh, Jibreel studied Quran with the Prophet, does not mean that you can read one juz every night and then do khatm al-Quran. Never, the Prophet never did Khatm Quran dua. Never. There's no one single hadith that says, do, when you finish Quran, make dua. 
Nothing. I can assure you. The only thing is mentioned is the only report is that Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, when he finished the entire Quran, he used to call his wife and his children around him and they make dua and they say Ameen. That's it. And it has to be 45 minutes with long introduction and then the body of the dua and then the wrap up of the dua and then that's it. It became a tradition. Is it a good tradition? I would say yes. There's nothing wrong with it. Is it a must? Do we have to do it? And do we have to do it in the 27th? Of course not. And we just need to educate ourselves. Because people get fanatic when they are not educated. This is what we know. This is what we think is the sixth pillar of Islam. Dua Khatul Quran is the sixth pillar of Islam. It's not the sixth pillar of Islam. We can perfectly... In our masjid, if we read every day, let's say we pray 20 rak'ah, and every rak'ah the Imam chooses any ayat or any surah to pray. That would be fine. That's Qiyamullah, yes, Qiyamullah. But how about dua? What about the Khatmul Quran, Ya Shaykh? What is Khatmul Quran? We don't have to have Khatmul Quran. Do we have to have Khatmul Quran? No, we don't have Khatmul Quran. What to have more people coming, mashallah? Khatm Quran night than any other time in the world in, in, the, in the year. So I, I'm not suggesting we should change it, but we just need to know it is something that the Muslim Ummah started and the ulama did not say anything. Most of the ulama, I would say, okay, because always some ulama will say not everything. And it became a tradition, it's a good tradition. Nothing wrong, no harm. The harm comes when we think it's a must, it's obligatory. If we don't do it, this Ramadan does not count. No, we can perfectly live a beautiful Ramadan without doing Khatm al-Quran. Right? Now. Traveling. Yes. Okay. Right. The question the brother is asking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the two excuses. If you are sick or traveling, then you can make it up later on. But in the end of the ayah, the first ayah, it says, but if you fast, it's better for you. This was the beginning of the tashrir of al asiyah It was optional. It was optional. You either fast or feed one person. There were Muhajri and Ansar, homeless Muslims and people who really need food. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you either fast or feed one person every, every day. But if you fast, it's better. If you can fast, it's better to fast. And then the next asset, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِي فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مُنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلِسْرِ Now we are, you don't have these options. You have just one option. That you, if you are fasting, if you are present when Ramadan comes, if you are not sick, not traveling, then you must fast. But still, the, the rukhsa is still there. If you are traveling fast, you still can break your fast. Right? That's why the Quran says, if you fast, if you can fast, it, it would be uh, bitter. I didn't look this side. Uh, any questions from this side? Okay. What time is uh, that today? Huh? 57? Okay. <laughs> the Battle of Badr. Is it the 17th? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. The 17th of uh, Ramadan, that's right. I confuse it with the uh, Ashim Ramadan. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, because of Ramadan, uh, we get a lot of invitations to have the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now we have Too much. Yes. Mm. And then you ask God, what happened to Aisha then? Well, that's another. Mm. Well, some, some, some say you have to go for Aisha. Okay. But between Madhrib and Aisha is enough to win for the whole month. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't get between those two things, people in our community. What, what do we do? What do we do? 
we do? The question is, I don't know if you heard the question that, that sometimes we are invited, you know, to um, eat uh, dinner with other families, but the conversation and the talks are, are good enough to go away with the thawab of the whole month. Well, we, we have to be positive. We, we have to not only do not participate in this negative talk, but we have to stop people. I mean, we have to advise. Uh, this is Amr Ma'roof wa Nahan Munkar. Um, you know, you don't participate in these vain talks and um, you should also advise your brothers and sisters not to talk about someone's absence or to talk negatively about something. Just let's talk about something positive. Let's, you bring things, you change the direction. Okay, so I heard, by the way, a very good khutbah two weeks ago and that was talking about this and that. Let everybody get, speak about something useful instead of talking about these negative things. I mean, if, if they start talking about someone, you know, uh, during his absence, then you, sh you should protect his dignity. You should know that I, that's, that, that's not the case. I know him, he's a good um, person and so on. And brothers, it's better not to talk. You, you have to do what you have to do. No, we cannot make the rule. You are encouraged actually to invite people and to visit people. Um, okay, breastfeeding and pregnant women. Two opinions. One or three actually. One is that they have to make up for the days they do not fast. If they are afraid that fasting will harm them or harm their babies. Um, uh, this is the Hanafi. Uh, it's it's like, like she's sick. Yani. She has an excuse, but this excuse is, 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 you know, is, is not permanent. So when she is able to fast, then she must make this day up. Um, others said, no, just feeding one miskin per day, uh, that will, will do it. And this is the opinion of Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar, uh, two great Sahaba, radiallahu anhu. Um, and they quoted this ayat, وَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ oh, No, sorry. وَعَلَىٰ الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُنَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ For those who can do it, but with difficulty. They should feed a miskin. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said this ayah is not mansukha, it's not abrogated. Still valid for specific people. Remember when I said it was optional and then became must? So Abdullah ibn Abbas said the second ayah did not abrogate the first ayah. Still optional for these ladies uh, who are breastfeeding or pregnant. Um, I would say that if she knows that she can, inshallah, get healthy again after she finish. Uh, nursing her baby and to make these days up she is still young mother and and she doesn't have plenty of children and she's not planning to have plenty of children in the future then it's better for her to make this to make these days up but if doesn't have to be made before next Ramadan doesn't have to it's better to do it as early as possible just to to get rid of this uh, responsibility but if the next Ramadan comes Still, you have to, to do it, right? Um, all right. One of the concerns in every masjid, uh, talking about the adab of bringing young kids to the masjid. Is it allowed? Is it recommended? Uh, yes, it is recommended to bring our kids. I may disagree with I, I, I'm like everybody else, I get disturbed with kids running around, but this is the only place that kids must be attached to. We need to do um, whatever it takes to accommodate these young children. Yes, kids are kids. They do what kids do. And to them, this place is the second home. We don't want to push them out. Rather, we need to be more creative in creating a nice space for them. In other messages, at the Unity Center, at the Tawheed Center, they have this cry room with ladies. They have their own huge, beautiful, nice space. They have this cry room with kids stay there. They scream and jump and play. Mothers can watch their children behind this glass. Kids play. Mothers pray. Everybody is happy. Husbands are happy. So, so, so it's not bringing kids or not to bring them. We must bring our kids to the masjid. We must. 
but we must also be creative in creating you know, the environment where they enjoy it and we also enjoy our, our son. And we have to be patient with our kids. At home, you know, we cannot control our kids and not ask them to run. Or so. They come and jump on our backs and they throw things and they mess things up. This is what kids do. And we have to be patient with our children. So we have to be patient with them at home and this is their second home. I hope, inshallah, and pray in the future we'll have all these arrangements. Last time. Alright, subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina aman wa amanu al-salihat wa tawasabu al-haq wa tawasabu al-sabr. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun al-musaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.